Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Reader Fair morning session. This is going to be a wonderful day. Let's read. I'm Meredith McGee, the chair of Community Library of Mississippi. And today, I decided I'm going to read a children's book. <laughs> and the name of it is Castle and Gretel. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. We can hear okay. you, but we can't see you. Y'all see uh, well, me? Oh, okay. We, I don't know why you me. can't see me. I can see you now, Meredith, but I can't. I can see me like we saw, like we saw before. But take your video. It has an X in it, a cross in it. Just click your video. I put it in the same joy. Let me see. And I try to put my name in. Don't put the name. Don't do the name. I do the name. Okay, Vicky, I'm I'm reading, so let me read it. You just get on, okay? Okay. Can y'all see the book? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Once upon a time, there was a boy and a girl named Hansel and Greta. They lived with their father, a poor woodcutter, in a little house beside a forest. Often the family went to bed hungry because there was not enough food to eat. Oh, wow. Okay. One day, the woodcutter took his children into the forest to gather wood. Hansel and Greta laughed and played so hard they wandered from their father and were soon lost. Their father okay, I them did that. okay. the rest of the, that day. Unfortunately, Hansel had many of his favorite pebbles with him and they had fallen to the ground one by one from the holes in his pockets. The children followed the path of shiny pebbles by moonlight back to their house. Their father was very happy to see them, but warned Hansel and Greta to stay close to home and not to wander away. Well, that was good. He found them like some pebbles. Y'all remember this story? Yes, oh, ma'am. Yeah, yeah we too. It's been a long time since I've been. <laughs> okay. A week later, <laughs> later, the children went to play in the forest again. They did not heed their father's warning and wandered far from home, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs behind them to follow back home. But the breadcrumbs were eating by the birds in the forest. And so Hansel and Greta realized they were lost again. Oh my God, they get lost again. <laughs> the children became tired and were very hungry as they roamed through the forest. Suddenly, there through the trees, they saw a strange little house made of cake and candy. Oh wow. They ran across something really good. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> They ran to the house and began eating from it furiously. There were <laughs> cake shingles and candy shutters. The windows were made of sugar. The flowers were lollipops. As they started to take a bite from the chocolate door, it opened. Out stepped an old woman with a wart on her nose. Who's eating my house, she said. Candle was starter. The children were starter at first, but the old lady seemed very kind. Ooh, she looks so nice. <laughs> Hansel and Greta apologized for eating from her house. We haven't eaten in such a long time, they said. The old lady took them in and fed them some good, wholesome food. This will fatten you up, she said. Shyly. Uh-oh. I don't know. Okay. I, I, I still can't get my full picture in there for some reason, but can y'all see me now? No, but we can hear you. Okay. It wasn't long before the old ladies 
kindly spirit wore off. She snared and ordered the children to work from morning to night. She had greater scrubbing floors and cleaning the oven. Hansel had to repair a broken table and gather heavy wood for the stove. Only a witch would act this way, Greta told Hansel. Wow. That, that house with candy was a uh, 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 something else. Woo, wait, look at the next page. <clears throat> Still, the witch fed them well. Hansel and Greta even gained a little weight. One night, as the witch stoked the coals in her oven, Greta heard her cackle. Tonight, I'll have Hansel and Greta for dinner. At that, Greta sneaked up behind the witch and pushed her into the oven. Oh, wow. Pushed in the oven. <laughs> this is a fairy tale, y'all. <clears throat> the witch was destroyed by the flames, and the oven became so hot that the house caught fire. As Hansel and Greta ran to the door, they came across chests full of gems and coins of gold. They gathered as much as they could into two potato sacks. They fled from the house. They ran until they could ran no further. Oh my God. They ended up with a, a sack full of gold and corn. So they done went from being poor, the children of a, a wood chopper to wealthy children with gold corns. Wow. They sat beneath a tree to catch their breath. Suddenly, they heard a voice call out, Hansel, Gretel. It was their father who had been searching for them since the day they were lost. They ran into their father's loving embrace. <laughs> all right. Y'all see how they go? Huh? Those are some happy children. <laughs> Look, Father Hansen exclaimed, opening the sack. More gold than we've ever dreamed of. We'll never be poor and hungry again. Oh my God, what a great story. From that day on, Hansel and Greta lived happily ever after with their father in the little house beside the forest. And they never went wondering again. Any questions, my friends? Um, I was reading that when I was real young. <laughs> okay, you had a question? Did the um like did the house burn down too, or was it just the witch? The house burned down, and when the house burned down, it turned into gold and coins. And they took a sack and put all the gold and coins in it, and they went back home. And they, in other words, they were poor children of a wood cutter, and after they met this witch who was trying to eat them, they pushed her in the oven, and she burned in the house. And they became wealthy without a sack of gold coins. Isn't that something? Yeah. Y'all can have any other questions about it? The moral. How did the witch get the how did the witch get the money? Uh Mary explained the, the dead in the moral for me. Yeah, I was just asking you, is there a moral to the story? Well, I I think the moral is that. The, they started off a poor, struggling family. And in the end, they get lost. But something good came out of them being lost because it changed their financial situation and they never had to be hungry again. To me, that was uh, the moral. Well, what your okay. kids think about it? Do y'all think, do y'all have another opinion about it? Something bad can happen can turn out for good. No, I guess. Uh, if no. If you're patient, things will happen. Yeah. Um, uh, what you saying? Like, don't ever wander off with it without your parents because you don't know what's gonna come up to you. 
that that's a good thought too because they was with a dangerous person because that witch was trying to kill them yeah that's true it's it's not good to get lost especially in this day and age and of course that was a fairy tale but the more of the fa fa fairy tale was uh a good moral yeah. okay well, well thank you you guys uh so uh mary Oh, okay. now I want to tell you, you uh, the children, Mary Hardy is actually a teacher of uh, um, the honors class in Greenville, Mississippi. The second grade class, is that right? Second through fifth grade this year. Second through fifth. fifth grade. And she is the only, um, she is the only black woman that owns a bookstore in the Mississippi, an uh, independent bookstore in the Mississippi. Delta called the book gallery. So that's very, very important to have a bookstore and and then it's black owned. Okay. Okay, so I am the author of two books, Uncle Hubbard and the Burlap Sack and Snippets of Truth. So I'm going to read one of the snippets from Snippets of Truth. And it's entitled, Butchering the Hogs and the Smokehouse. We always had one or two hogs to butcher so that we would have meat for the winter and into the spring and summer. Putting the hogs to rest was always a special occasion in the winter months of November and December. In preparation for the big day, we cleaned the round black pot and placed it in a well-cleared area where we'd heat it up, where we'd heat up water over a wooden fire to keep the pot hot. The hot water was then used to clean the meat and the chitlins. Then I did not know as much as I know now about the delicacy of chitlins. Chitlins are eaten, boiled, or fried, and with hot sauce. In the early years, we only ate them fried. I learned the other ways to prepare them after moving to the Delta, the flatland state, flatland area of the state. We stored the meat in the smokehouse, my grandfather and daddy took care of the smokehouse and secured the meat for the winter month. They, they placed the meat, sausage, ham, and other types of meat on a rack where it would hang until it was cured and ready to be eaten by the family and shared with the community. It was always a joy to visit the smokehouse to get meat better than going to the store after leaving home, when I had to shop for groceries, it was very difficult to purchase meat from the market. The selection was not the same and the taste not quite as good. And that's butchering the hogs um, in the smokehouse. I wonder, uh, uh, Mary, could you explain to, to the children the difference between when you were growing up and you all had a smokehouse and you produce your own meat and today where you have to go and buy everything that used to be in the smokehouse. All right, so growing up, I grew up in uh, South Mississippi and we had everything we needed on the farm. The only thing that my daddy would have to buy would be flour that you make this. We grew our corn, so we had our, our corn that we would take to the grist mill to have it ground into meal. So we had our vegetables, our fruits, and our feet, everything that we needed right there at home. Now, most people in the community didn't have that. We did, so we shared our um, produce and meats with the uh, entire community. 
And what did y'all have in the smokehouse? We had the meat from the, we butcher the hogs. So we would have the meat from the hogs in the smokehouse. We would have, uh, my mother would make the sausage. And we still have that sausage blender at home now. So we'd have sausage, bacon, um, the ham, the all of that hanging in the smokehouse. So when we got ready for sausage, we just go out to the smokehouse and get the sausage. So when I got married, left home, it was very difficult for me to go to the grocery store and buy that stuff because I never had to do it. <laughs> we always had it. Uh, to this day, it's very difficult for me because I keep thinking back to, you know, years ago that I didn't have to do that. And of course, I like cabbage. So we always grew our cabbage. And now I have to go to the store, the grocery store, to buy a cabbage. And it's very difficult for me to do. Where are you from? I'm from McGee, Mississippi, which is 50 oh. miles south of Jackson. I'm 49 between Jackson and Hattiesburg. Simpson County. What you are, Simpson what County. You are saying. What you are saying is that and uh, my, I saw my grandfather slaughter a hog and uh, and he was doing all the same things that y'all were doing down in Dada and McKee. We was doing the same things up in the Delta. Okay, yeah. What part of the Delta? Huh? What what part of the Delta? Clarksdale. At the crossroads, the home of the blues. Oh yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I'm familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> but that was what I was bringing up. My, my my point was all that you were saying that you were growing up with at down in McGee. I was growing up with up in the Delta uh, outside of Clarksdale because my grandfather owned this farm. He used to he used to. Okay. What are does, do any of the kids have any questions? Or did you learn anything? Um yes. What did you learn? We learned about how she used to grow up and how she used to have everything. Um we she didn't really need to go to the grocery store unless she wanted to buy buy weed. She we she uh, never needed it she like flour. Yeah, flour. But we most of the time we need to go out and go to many people need to go out and go to the grocery store instead of growing their own crops and, and corn and more and in, in front of uh your house your parents uh, uh i know there's some corn in in the, in the yard because uh what else is out there corn and some kind of vegetables right yes ma'am mm -hmm. uh, what kind of vegetables are y'all growing over there I don't know. Oh, we have a garden and we have, have a garden. I have one too. I have oh, yeah, a garden in my backyard. I have, I have a garden in my backyard. backyard too. Oh yeah, what do y'all grow in your backyard? I have corn, I have peppers, I have greens and stuff like that. I have okra. okra. Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh-huh. Well, we have something over here. We have uh tomatoes, jalapeno peppers, Red uh, peppers, oh, we have green too. peppers, uh, squash. Uh, oh. I think that's it that we have over here. Well, that's good. At uh, least we got something we can go outside uh, and, and, and eat. And one time, huh? one time, one time we got an eggplant. Oh, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. My grandma used to make uh, eggplant, egg, eggplant pies. They were so good. Kind of tastes like sweet potato pie, but it's just a little, little different. Okay. Well, okay. the only thing I have in my garden, I have basil and peppers. Oh, that's good because I need some of that basil. basil. I have plenty of basil. <laughs> oh, wow. I need some of that for cooking. Okay. Uh, we, you yes. Uh -huh. Y'all have not had a fried eggplant. Y'all have not had a fried eggplant. Y'all haven't had a fried eggplant. Okay. Well, you, 
Okay, the, uh, this is uh, Jackson Free Press. It's about the legislature and overtime. Criminal justice reform is the top priority. Uh, a chance for parole. At the heart of the legislative push for criminal justice reform is a combined bill containing many changes to the state's parole system, which legislative efforts in the tough on crime era of the 1990s heavily restricted. Senate Majority Leader Derek Simmons, Democrat of Greenville, stressed that the parole reforms would provide the opportunity for more than a half of Mississippi's 19,000 prisoners to receive parole. The bill would create two categories of parole. The, the case of nonviolent offenders incarcerated would be uh, they would be eligible for parole after serving 25% of their sentence for 10 years, whichever is less. For violent offenses, parole eligibility will begin after individuals serve 50% of their sentence or 20 years in prison, whichever is less. The legislation, if successful, if, if successful would also mandate prompt time prompt timelines for the completion of parole case plans. The bill returns our statutes to a time in Mississippi where inmates had incentives to behave. Simmons said adding this does not guarantee any release. This creates an environment of hope. It creates an environment where people are encouraged to behave in a good manner. The criminal justice reform ominous bill addresses more than public eligible more than parole eligibility, Simmons said. It also addresses habitual reform, offender reform. It also looks at ways to increase access to credit reductions for good behavior. It ties to guarantee that a parole eligible person has their parole hearing within a reasonable time. The Mississippi Correctional Safety and Rehabilitation Act will be the primary vehicle for the changes. Got to turn the page here. Okay. You said this bill became a law? No, they're just up for debate, up, up for, for votes, you know. It hadn't been approved yet. The Corrections Committee Chairman, Senator Juan Barnett, a Democrat of Heidelberg, is the primary author of the bill. Senate Bill 2123 will be the primary vehicle for the parole reforms. House Corrections Committee Chairman Representative Kevin Horan, Democrat of Grenada, who authorized a similar ominous bill, is part of the conference that is scheduled to reconcile the two bills. The Ban the Box Bill, the Senate Bill 2112, is also in conference. The bill will remove the presence of a prior criminal record, the preliminary bar to, to uh, employment, giving job applicants the ability to present credentials before employees wholesale disregard them from consideration for employment. Pretty much it. I mean, you won't be automatically disregarded for employment if you have a prior criminal record. Any questions? Um, no, no, ma'am. So, um, why do you think that bill should become a law, William? Well, uh, we need reform in the criminal justice system and not encourage people to go back and commit crimes again. We need to have uh, incentives for people not to commit crimes and rather than encourage them to commit crimes. And what kind of incentives did, did the bill discuss? Um, you would offer uh, people uh, a chance to get a job. Um, they would have a chance to get a job where the other way they would automatically be excluded. If they can get a job and get back out in the community and earn a living, 
And that way they wouldn't they would have more incentive not to commit a crime. Okay. So would they have to be out for a certain time before they get a job, or would they could they immediately uh, get a job? It kind of sounded like right away they would be eligible for a job when they get out of get out of jail. You know. Okay. Right um, what? Out of prison. Uh -huh. Okay, so which one of you kids is leading next? And tell us your name and uh, what grade you'll be going to next year. Yes. Okay, you go. Okay, so one of y'all got to. Ladies first. Let the lady go first. <laughs> Ladies okay. first. Come on, let's read. <laughs> Okay, so the name of my story is The Wild Wild West by Jerry Nimo Stilton. And tell us your name and what grade you're going to next year. Okay, my name is Sharon Swan. I'm 10 years old. I'm going to fifth grade. Okay. After a day at the office, I like to relax in my cozy mouse hole. I slid into my furry fluffy cat fur slippers. Then I settle down with a good book in front of the fi fireplace. I make myself a nice cup of hot cheddar tea. And sometimes I put on some soft music. Of course, some rodents might say I'm a little on the boring side, like my sister Thea and my cousin Trap. They make fun of me because I don't like to travel. They say I'm a scaredy cat, scaredy mouse. You see, I am not the adventurous type, but that is but that is because I get seasick, <laughs> heights make me dizzy, and I need a worry ward. Now, you're probably wondering what, am I, what I'm doing in this adventure. It takes place in a wild, wild west. Out west, you will find the sun scorched de deserts, raging bulls, and even poisonous snakes. Why would I, Jeronimo, Scaredy Mouse Stilton, travel to a place like that? Read the Read this book and you'll understand. Four Mouse in the Wild West. It was hot, it was dry, it was bad, bad for a day. Even my ter tail was sweating. Oh, what, it, what I wouldn't give for a cold cheddar ice pop from a mega, from a, my mega huge fridge. Too bad I couldn't get one. Do you want to know why? Because I was in a, Arizona desert. Yes, mouse fans. I, Jeremiah Stilton, was in the wild, wild west. Lucky for me, I was alone. My sister Thea, my cousin Chop, and my little nephew J Benjamin were with me. Together we were crossing the scorching desert. Have you ever been to a desert? There is not much to see. Just sand, rocks, and cactus. The sand burned my paws. I kept tripping over rocks and my tail was getting ripped to shreds on all those pointy cactus needles. Worst of all, I was dying of thirst. I, sh I shook my canteen. It was empty. Just then, I don't fell over me. I go. Something told me it wasn't Santa Mouse flying by on his way to his summer place. I looked up. Racing rat hairs. It was a hungry pack of vultures waiting to lick our bones. This place was a total nightmare. Okay. After a billion years, we finally reached a dusty set of railroad tracks. Cheesecake. We were saved. The tracks led us to a wooden sign. In big letters, it read, Welcome to Cactus City. Go home, save yourself, hit the trail if you value your trip. Tail. I twisted my tail up in knots. Uh-oh, I go. This doesn't look good. This doesn't look good at all. In fact, this looks downright bad, if you ask me. Trap pushed me forward. Oh, don't be such a scaredy mouse, Jim, Jim Meister, he snorted. Gave me another show. I tumbled head first into a cactus. Don't push me. I can't stand it when you push me, I yelled, picking needles. Have I told you my cousin Trap is the most 
annoying rodent on the planet. That is Cactus City. Oh yeah, what's the name of the city? Cactus, Cactus city. city. Okay. Okay. What's wrong with Cactus City? A wiry old mouse stood in front of the railroad station. He was dressed in a uniform. Howdy, strangers. What brings you to Cactus City? He called, waving us over. The name's Choo Choo Cheddar. That's CC for short, he chattered. I landed Paul down here at the station. Yep, been working here for some 20 years. I sell tickets, carry bags. Yep, my name is, you name it, I've done it. Sometimes I even, suddenly CC stopped in mid-sentence. I noticed he was staring at us with an odd impression of, on his snout. Well, golly, he cried. You mouselings must have come from way far yonder. Just look at your duds, shucks. You're dressed just like the city mouse. Cece, Cece offered us some stewed beans and a sip of water. Sorry, I can't get you more to drink, he said in a low voice. Water is, so, is hard to come by in these parts. He looked around nervously. Then he whispered, let me give you some advice, strangers. Get out of town now. How strange. What was wrong with Cactus City? It looked like a nice little town to me. I was still thinking about CeCe's words when a train rumbled into the station. A rat with long glass wax whiskers got off. It was Curly, the train conductor. Cactus City, last station before the desert, he yelled. No one got off the train. No one stopped in Cactus City. How strange. What was wrong with Cactus City? We decided to check out the town. First, we passed the blacksmith's shop. A huge muscle mouse was hammering away on a piece of metal. He was making a horseshoe. A mouse carrying a doctor's bag scampered by. Clear the way, he squeaked. Nancy Nibbler's about, Nancy Nibbler's about to have those triplets. A plump mouse stuck his head out of the building door. It was the banker. He looked around nervously, then he raced back inside. I wonder why he was looking so worried. Just then, I heard a familiar noise. It was a printing press. A rat with tiny glasses was busy printing the newspaper. He glanced up at us suspiciously. We passed by a courthouse. An old judge peeked out the door. He looked around and he slammed the door shut. In front of the saloon, a rodent sat in a rocking chair. A big hat covered his face. He stopped rocking when we walked by. How odd, I thought he was napping, but it seemed as if he was hiding from something. Minutes later, we ran into the undertaker. He shook our paws warmly. He had a huge grin plastered on his face. At least one rodent wasn't worried, I thought. Welcome to Cat Cactus City, strangers. The Undertaker, the Undertaker being. If I can be of service, don't be shy. Today I'm having two for two, two for one special. Yes, sirree. That's two stiffs for the price of one. A buck tooth rodent stood next to him. He held up a shovel. I guess he was a grave digger. Just tell me how deep and I will dig it. I shivered. Then I noticed something else that was strange about Cactus, Cactus City. There was no sheriff. Do you know what a sheriff does? He keeps order in the town. He locks a bad rodent in jail. Sort of like the chief of police in Now City. That was the first 10 pages. Okay, very good. And um, I want to ask you a question. You mentioned the undertaker. Yes, um, what, what what did the undertaker do? Um, the undertaker was like the person who was giving out the meals. He said that he would give them two meals for one for one dollar. Two things for one dollar. So that means he's like selling stuff to people. Was there a moral in the store? Was there a what? A moral. 
Like a moral? Yeah. Um, no, I haven't finished it yet, so you can't, we can't, we couldn't get to the moral yet. Very okay. good, very good. Um, well, you are a fluent reader. Yes, she is. Thank you. <laughs> Facial expressions, just the whole bit. Very good. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh-huh. And that comes from a, a teacher, an honors teacher. <laughs> All right. And so uh who's next? Here? No, never. Because tell us your name and um uh, what grades you're going to. Um my name is Clarence Gong and I'm going to seventh grade. Very good. The name of my story is Attack. On the of the Bandit Cats by Jeremiah Stilton. Show us the cover. By the way, Jeremiah Stilton is a mouse. Okay, thank you. The first chapter of the book. We want Stilton. What a rat's nest this morning in front of my office. When I came up from the subway, I saw mice of all shapes and sizes packing the streets. All their snouts were in the air. They were, they were staring at the window of my office. The crowd began to chant, Stilton, Stilton, we want Stilton, Jeremiah Stilton. Uh-oh, I had a feeling these mice weren't looking for my autographs. Luckily, no one recognized me. Because, you see, I am Jeremiah Stilton, quiet as a mouse. I wriggled through the crowd and sneaked up the back stairs. I dashed into my office, huffing and puffing for air. I really need to get back to the gym. Rats Lana. My secretary, Marcella, ran to me to meet me. Mr. Stilton heard this horrible news. She squeaked, waving the phone book we had just printed. New Mouse City, yellow pages are a disaster. Yellow pages are like, in this story, yellow, they're calling the yellow pages the, the word they have, like all the, uh, the book of all types of phone numbers of all the people. And she said, the yellow pages are a disaster. There isn't one correct phone number, not one. Pell as a slice of mozzarella cheese. I, I leafed through the book. Address, telephone numbers, they're all wrong. I'm ruined, I shrieked, pulling at my whiskers. I heard the crowd yelling and, and leaned out of my window. They had a, a lit a huge bonfire right in front of the middle of the street. They were burning my... my directories. A fierce looking mouse pointed at me with his paw. That's him. That's Jeremiah Stilton, the one who published the Yellow Pages. He's the one who's turned New Mouse City on its tail. The crowd began chanting again, Stilton, Stilton, we want Stilton. Suddenly, all the telephones in my office start ringing, start ringing started ringing. I, I answered the phone on my desk. This is the, that's the yellow pages. Oh, that's right the here. yellow pages? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that's Jen I will Stilton. Okay. I need to speak with that cheddar face, Mr. Stilton. An angry voice nod on the other end. Um, Mr. Stilton? Isn't here, I squeaked in a high-pitched voice. Hopefully the caller wouldn't know it was me. I don't know where he is, I continued. He might be in the hospital with an ingrown toenail. Or maybe he's helping out he's helping out down at the Creek Mouse Mouse nursing home. He does a lot of charity work, you know. I decided, I decided to unplug the telephones, but the fax machines were, were all spitting out nasty letters. Threatening emails popped up on my computer screen. 
We know where you live. You can't hide. No hole is safe. Mouse, mouse, Mousella wrung the, the, her paws. Tears rolled down her snout. Mr. Stilton, this is a total disaster. Even our own telephone number is wrong. She squeaked. We are the, we are now the fairy tales toilet paper company. Don't, don't worry, Marcella. I have everything under control. I cried, closing my eyes. Maybe I, I was just having a bad dream. I could, I waited for a few seconds, then opened my eyes. The rodents outside were throwing moldy cheese at my windows. No, bad dream. It was a living nightmare. What's a fur brain was the name of the next chapter. Just then, Blunders, my editor-in-chief, knocked at the door. Mr. Stilton, your cousin Trap is here. He announced, tripping over his tail. I am not in for anyone, I shouted. Blunders jumped, spilling the mug of cheddar tea. Oh, well, he said, it's urgent. He said, I am not in, I repeated. Next thing I knew, my cousin, a plumish mouse with beady eyes, was standing before me. He put both paws on my desk and smiled. Have you ever met, met my cousin? He owns a shop in downtown, New Mouse City. Cheap Junk for Less is the name of his, his shop. Cheap Junk for Less. And he's a terrible prankster. And his favorite hobby is teasing me. Another thing you should know about Trap is he's like a refrigerated, a refrigerator magnet for trouble. Some, sometimes you can't tear those two apart. What do you want? Can you see I'm busy, I yelled. And please take your paws off my desk. Hello there, Cuskins. What's, what's up? He squeaked, picking his teeth with my letter opener. And that's the um, cousin child. Okay. I took off my glasses so that I could cry freely. Can you see I'm in big trouble here? I choked. I choked. Oh, why did I choose this job? I could have been a lifeguard down at water or water rat park or a waiter at cheese at the cheese garden trap smirk are you kidding a fur brain like you couldn't do this those jobs i'm not a fur brain i squeaked just then the phone rang in a flash trap had his paw on the receiver if if it's for me please tell them i am not in i Begged. He picked up the phone and straightened his tie. Hello, this is the Stilton Publishing Company. No, Mr. Stilton is not in. Yes, yes, I agree. He is is a hopeless cheddar face, a total nincompoop. My cousin <laughs> nodded. Well, of course, I will tell him he is a complete fur brain. Thank you. Thank you for calling. He added before hanging up. I twisted my whiskers in rage. Steam poured out of my ears. I felt like a cheddar cheese marshmallow left in the microwave too long. I asked you to stay, to say I was not in, I shrieked. I didn't say make friends with any wacky mouse who caused, who caused. That wasn't any wacky mouse. My cousin assisted. I was talking to Saucy La Paz, the famous chef. He says you switched the number of his restaurant with one of your of the for the city dump. I I better not tell you where he said he wanted to send you. All of a of a sudden, my cousin's eyes lit up. Hey, that reminds me. Do you do you know why I'm here? I put my head. I put my head in my paws. Yes, I do, I mumbled. You are here to drive me nuts. And it's not working. 
I'm packing my, my bags for a Mad Mouse Center. I, I leave tonight. Not so fast, Trap said, giggling. I am here to get you out of this mess. Just listen to my brilliant idea. I groaned. Not another one of my cousin's, cousin's brilliant ideas. The last time I got involved with one of, the, of his crazy mouse schemes, I'd end up stuck in a spooky castle in Trastania. And that's the um, person who called on the phone. Okay. And that's, that's, the the pages. that's the first 11 pages of the book. The okay. Very, very good. And now, so uh, tell us uh, what is your summary of the first, uh, what do you think happened? What did, was the lesson about working and on a job? Well, Janamo Stilton, he he is a he's a mouse who works at a he works at a printing press, so he prints in a newspaper. Then he made the telephone books that they used to have, and then they were like, that, though, that book tells all of the right addresses, I mean, phone numbers to like the restaurants and the city dumps and all those different places. But they got somehow they were all wrong and he was in big trouble because people uh, w uh, wanted to do something to him just because the things were messed up so anything they wanted to call won't be right because they switched the phone numbers by mistake so his, his cousin trap tried to fix that problem and that's where the um he had a brilliant idea and that's where the story that's where the um the first story. 11 pages ended 10 and so, did, did they fix it? Did they fix the problem yet? At the end of the story? Yes, ma'am. They ended up fixing the problem. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, any other questions? So, is he considered the main character in the book? Yes. He's the yes, main character? Yes, ma'am. Ma What's the main Thank character's you. name? Jerry and I'm Okay. All right, so you ready to read? Yes. Tell us your name and, and uh, what place we're going to next year and what you're reading. My name is Harry Chia, and I'm going to second grade and not first grade. I'm going to be in sixth grade. You're, go you're going to first grade. I'm you're going ready. to first grade, and I'm six years old. Hold your book up so we can see it. Grandpa, Grandpa. Grandma, Grandpa, and the tractor. Okay. Grandpa and Grandma got a brand new tractor. We didn't see it. You still there? There, it's just frozen. Yo, um, adjust the phone. <laughs> Bad reception. Uh oh. I think he hit the phone when he was reading the book. What Sorry. now? I think he hit the phone when he was reading the book. Oh, okay. they lost lost reception. Yeah, we oh, lost okay, reception. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have something to read, Vicky? Yeah, I got uh <clears throat> Reverse guilty. Please. Well, um, just read two pages because uh, when he jumped back on, we um, I think I'm gonna have to call him and tell him that he get kicked out. 
You can read the two pages and I'm gonna call them. And he read on the first day of the third grade. Luckily, in the same poor name, they faded out Charles' life. Charles's mother, Angie, was a housewife and a very good one. And then his father, Terry Wilson, was the breadwinner. He read a lucrative accounting practice from their home. Terry's father. Terry's father, Philip, became a bookkeeper in a uh, general merchandise store in the roaring 1920s. He renamed the profession for that for the rest of that Philip's father, Mason, which was the tenant's father. With the third grade education, who got deeper in debt each year. On Philip's 15th birthday, he reviewed the disgusting crop statement from the um, landowner, knocked over a few stalks of corn that started a walking, let me say, that knocked over a few stalks of, of, of stalks of corn, started walking up the road, carrying five biscuits and a paper bag. Philip spent the last of the three pennies at Farmer's General Store in Houston, Mississippi. Overheard Philip crying and when Mr. Palmer discovered Philip had lost both of his parents is a both of his parents a housewife but well, excuse me both of his parents and a house fire took philip on his first border and gave him a job as his first border and gave him a job 50 years later philip rented the room as a flat the day he put a put linen on the poor guy's bed, he drove down to the same road he had walked up at age 15. And when he turned on the ignition and his Chevy truck, Chevy truck off was looking at this farmer sitting on the porch, leading on the scale of some burnt Mother Fanny Lou was stirring over some cornbread. Mother Fanny Lou was stirring over some cornbread, flapjacks, and in a big cast of skillet. An hour longer visit, Philip discovered the road in which he stopped in front of the house. He led his parents and their in their new room with a pair of overalls and the Sunday uh, dress. He introduced his parents at church and here henceforth, neither ever worked another day in their lives. Once a week, Mason and Fannie Lou pulled out all of their postcards <clears throat> And Philip sent them during his five week absence, laid them under a kitchen table in order to date and read them as if they were a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. They discussed particularly such as the fact that the four. Uh, 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 oh, oh, oh. Hey, come on, that one. Uh, okay. Hush, hush. Oh, oh. Oh, sh Okay, 
and then she took an interest in their father's and grandfather's Philip line of work. In the early life, she spent countless evenings in the office where her father. Okay. What now? What? What? What am I hearing? Grandpa. That's okay, Grandma and the oh, tractor. Okay, hold on now. Uh, uh, hold on here. She was reading while you was going. Let her finish and then you'll start jumping. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. You can stand right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, Let me go. Oh, okay, stay right there. Oh, you can go ahead and finish, Vicky, and then uh, he's he, you're gonna be the last reader. I'll uh, him. Okay, Vicky, you can go ahead and finish. Oh, you talking to me? Uh -huh, you can finish. So, um, a reader, um, another a page, mm -hmm. then we'll ask you some questions, then we'll let him fin. Um, he's the last reader. Oh, okay, Aubrey treasured Phillips memory and she took an interest in her father and grandfather Phillips line of work early in life. You do, Vicky? Vicky? Cookies while they were lying on the while they were lying on the kitchen sink sheets cooling. Other than those occasions, Aubrey, Aubrey was more interested in the sources of money than in a household of the room. It was produced in which her father's home, after located in the, on the east of the house, adjoining the living room on the other side, Charles was interested in a good book. You're not so hard, you know it. Okay, um, Vicky. What did you do? Vicky. You um, you was reading two different chapters, huh? What now? You was reading the one chapter I remember uh in the in uh reverse gifts of please uh when um the characters' parents were reading his the postcards they hadn't seen a sign in a long time, and then right you, then, you, then you jumped to the beginning of the book. But anyway, that's that's one of my favorite parts of that book is um how those parents love their son so much that even though he stopped coming to visit them, they would read his postcards uh every day. Uh now, just the piece that they had of him. I'm just um uh huh oh oh and William Tress is the author of that book. William I bet you were surprised that she was Reading yeah, your, your first book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she told me she was going to read it. Oh, she did? Yeah. I thought, I, I, I thought that was cute, Billy. I thought that was cute. I said, well, let me read, let me read this book here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very great um, novella. And uh, anybody else have a question for Vicky? Before we go to that last reader. Mm -hmm. You have a question, Henry? No, no, I'll call you back. Okay, you you I'll ready to read? Yes, ma'am. You go ahead, go ahead and hold your book up and and now okay. uh, go ahead and read. Grandma, Grandpa, and the tractor. Okay. Grandpa and Grandma. Got a new, a brand new tractor. Okay. There is always a good job for a good tractor, said Grandpa, and there was. <coughs> In the spring, <clears throat> the tractor dug up the dirt for planting. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Hold up the mower. 
Okay. Okay. In the summer, the tractor dug big stones to the stone wall. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <clears throat> In the fall, the tractor got all the pumpkins into the barn. Vroom, vroom, vroom. <clears throat> all right. In the winter, the tractor pushed the snow <coughs> off the driveway. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Grandpa kept the tractor <coughs> in the shed. He put a blanket and rope, a rope on the tractor. <coughs> Time went by in the farm, and the farm got bigger the little tractor couldn't could not do all the jobs anymore <coughs> in the spring a big new machine dug up the dirt for planting in the summer a <coughs> big new truck Drove the stones to the stone wall. In the fall, a a big in the fall, a big new machine got all the pumpkins into the barn. In the winter, a big new plow pushed the snow off the driveway. Okay. Grandpa, the tractor was in the shed, so so was Grandpa. I guess we are both getting old, he told the tractor. <coughs> no, said Grandma. Not yet. She took off she so she took off the blanket and the rope. There is always a good a job for a good tractor, said she said. And and there was and there was zoom zoom zoom. And the, that's the end. Oh wow! Okay. Like, so this this was set in the winter time, uh, where it was snowing. Yes, ma'am. And who was the main character? Grandpa and Grandma. Okay. So have you seen a real tractor? Mm, no, ma'am. All right. So you need to travel south and go visit my parents' farm. They have a, they have real tractors. There. Oh, they still on the farm? Oh, yeah. I was there two weeks ago. Yeah, they still have the farm. How old are they? My mother is still alive. My dad's deceased. My mother's 92. But they have everything down there. Cows, pigs. It just looks like water. Oh, like, you know, I'm, I'm gay. We should go. <laughs> you should go. Just get yeah, in the car. We should go before the summer is over. That's right. Just get uh -huh. in the car and drive down there. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, 45 I'm ready. 50 minutes from Jackson. Well, if any of you all want to go, let me know and let's get in the car and go before the summer's over. Yeah. They have, they have three or four pet pigs. That are half as tall as I am. Pigs. Pigs. Pigs have a tall. They're pet pigs. 
Wow. Oh, those were uh, tell us um, uh, Henry, what you what you thought the uh, did, was there more to the story? No, ma'am. The barn. You want to mm -hmm. give a summary of what happened, ma'am? A summary. You want to give a summary of what happened in the story? Everything like a short summary of everything that happened like, shortly. Mm, yes, ma'am. Okay. Grandma and Grandpa got a new tractor, so they used it to do stuff. They used it for work. They used it for work. Then the tractor, then the farm got bigger, and the tractor couldn't do it all. So they got new vehicles to do the work for the tractor. Very good. Very good. Yeah, very good. Wow, this has been a great session. And uh, so we'll we'll see you guys at uh two fifteen and thank you so much for um uh, uh reading today with us. Yes, um, I have got a, a doctor's appointment coming up pretty soon at about one thirty. Okay, so you won't be able to get, get on that's that's fine. We well, uh have a good visit with your doctor. Okay, thank you. I'll right, see, okay. see you guys later. <laughs> see you, Mary. Okay. All right. See you. See you. All right, back here. Yeah, I, will, I, I will finish your reverse the guilty plea. Okay, thank you, Vicky. <laughs> okay, then. See you guys Don't later. Pass it. Go away. Okay. Right. All right. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. We still on. I was still on for one thirty. It's two fifteen. Huh? It, we changed it to two fifteen. One thirty to fifteen. Okay. No, no, two fifteen to two fifty five. Two fifteen to two fifty five. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna put this video on um uh, on YouTube and on Facebook virtual okay. reading fair. Okay. In case y'all want to look at it. Okay. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>